Hey team, just a quick note before we get started, this episode is brought to you by Matrixport and Coinbase Prime. Big thanks to them for making the show possible. You'll hear more about them later. Now on with the show. So all the technology today is designed to reduce the amount of labor and resources that we need, which is the which is the disinflationary impact of technology versus the inflationary impact of technology many years ago. All right, everyone, welcome back uh, to another episode of On the Margin. Today, I am joined by Eric Basmajian. Did I get that right, Eric? That's pretty good. All right, pretty good. All right, uh, look at us, both black shirt gang today. Uh, we didn't yeah, even right? coordinate this, uh, if you could believe it. Um, <laughs> just a couple of good looking guys in black shirts. Um, <laughs> awesome, man. I, I'd love to start out uh, just kind of almost from like a 10,000 foot view of what your overall framework, macro framework is. Um, you're one of the few out there that are still advocating uh, in a really eloquent way. Um, kind of this argument that we might be actually headed towards deflation. So when you kind of just look at macro framework, uh, overall way of looking at the world and markets, what are kind of some of the things that jump out at you? Sure. So I'll, um, I'll give my whole background and kind of weave it into my process, kind of how I ended up uh, with the view that I have. Uh, I studied economics at, at NYU and a lot of my work that I was doing in my, in my spare time outside of uh, my educational background was in long-term economic trends, what I call secular economic trends. So things that influence the economy over, you know, way more than three to five year periods. That would be sort of the shortest time period that a secular trend would 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 show up. So uh, the two major factors that contribute to an economy's secular economic trends would be demographics and productivity. So mm-hmm. sort of population and productivity. Population is pretty straightforward and we have uh, estimates going forward uh, of 10, 20 years into the future, which are fairly reliable with various immigration estimates and things like that. Then the other swing factor is productivity. So how do you get a read on productivity? And one of the biggest factors that impacts productivity through all of the peer-reviewed research is, uh, is debt. And uh, debt impacts productivity in a lot of different ways that we, that we can get into. But basically the situation in the United States and in most of the developed countries around the world is they have declining rates of population growth. So population mm-hmm. growth 10 years from now is going to be lower than it is today. That's a disinflationary force. And economies have um, extremely heavy debt loads, both public and private. Mm-hmm. And that's a disinflationary force. So most of my work was, was all in long-term economic trends, focusing on those two factors primarily. The problem is that uh, after I graduated, I went to go work at, uh, in the buy side of the financial sector at a quantitative hedge fund. And as most uh, investment professionals are aware of, uh, three to five years is a difficult time frame to work with. Although, you know, the longer your time frame is, the higher chance you have to be accurate. But most investors can't wait three to five years for a trend to play out, let alone three months. I mean, most people are really looking for monthly or quarterly uh, performance. So uh, I, I furthered my study of economics and I uh, started to uh, look at what we call cyclical economic trends. So within a secular economic trend, you have sort of what's called a growth rate cycle. And to give a really clean example of what I'm talking about here is from 2010 to 2019 before COVID, it was one long expansion, but there were tons of cyclical ups and downs that happened in the meantime. For example, there was a huge um, acceleration in the economy from 2016 to 2018, and then there was a a huge downturn in the economy from 2018 through 2019. The Federal Reserve started cutting interest rates. This was before COVID. Mm -hmm. So even within an expansion, you can have these cyclical ups and downs. And having those two disciplines, a secular framework and a cyclical framework, was fairly unique in the marketplace because those two outlooks require different disciplines. A long-term economic outlook relies more heavily on economics and economic uh, fundamentals and uh, perhaps some econometrics, where a cyclical framework, we use what we call leading economic indicators. So uh, to round the whole thing out, I have a secular economic view which is very much towards lower growth and lower inflation. But I also have a cyclical economic view, which is in the six to 18 month range. Uh, I gave an uh, interview with Lynn Alden uh, back in January of this year, where I was calling for a cyclical upturn in both growth and inflation. That materialized through, through the beginning of this year. And around the summertime, I pivoted to a cyclical downturn in economic growth, but not yet a cyclical downturn in inflation. 
just over the past couple of weeks, we've fully started to see the beginning of the cyclical downturn in inflation. So now we have a long-term secular economic downturn in growth and inflation, and we also have a cyclical downturn in growth and inflation. And that's sort of where we are today. You know, we talk on the show a lot about inflation versus deflation. Um, and on one hand, there's just such a compelling point when you look at this historical chart. So I just recorded my co-host on the show, this guy named Mark Yusko. We kind of looked at periods. It was like 800 years of economic history, right, in between, um, you know, credit and fiat money expansion and inflation. And it literally is like over 800 years, it's a, you know, nine out of 10 hit rate, right? When, the, when, these, uh, when, when that tends to happen, you do get inflation. Um, on the other hand, the environment that we were in pre-COVID, right, it was one of exactly what you're saying, deflation, lack of structural growth, if anything, cyclical driven growth and credit uh, driven growth. Since COVID, if anything, those trends have just been accelerated, uh, right? So all of the same things that, that uh, the same factors that contributed to um, the secular period of deflation that we were in have only seemed to actually be exacerbated. So right on the one hand, I can see this super compelling argument for their supply chain disruptions, the money creations, like 40% of M2 has been created in the last couple, uh, 18 months, I think. Uh, so I really can see that from a historical framework that we are headed towards inflation. On the other hand, there's so many factors pointing towards deflation too. How, how do you, help me think through that. Like, how, how do you parse out those, <clears throat> those two arguments? Yeah, so um, after, co or, or when COVID happened, uh, there were stay-at-home orders basically across the entire world for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, countries, specifically the United States, threw out a lot of fiscal stimulus. So what happened was uh, we had to stay at home and we had more money in our pockets. And what happened was there was a radical shift in consumption uh, in terms of services consumption versus durable goods consumption. There was an insane shift towards durable goods. And that happened on a global scale, basically all at once. And when you have such an insane increase in demand, but you have constricted supply, supply and demand tells you sure. that you gotta, you gotta clear at a higher price. There's no doubt about that. And uh, that started a manufacturing upturn around the world because we depleted all of these durable goods inventories and now manufacturers had to replace them. And that's not an overnight type process that can take several months and we saw a huge global reflation that emanated from the manufacturing sector all the industrial commodities anything that was even remotely correlated to restocking inventories had huge reflationary uh, boom and that partly was related to the supply chains one of the factors in economics though is if uh, the price increases the quantity supplied increases <laughs> right so right. if you're a lumber producer and you see lumber at two thousand uh, uh, $2,000 a board or whatever the, the, the metric is, you're going to start to produce a lot more lumber. And if we see the, the um, consumption patterns normalize, where we go back to a, a split of more services than goods, uh, then we're going to have uh, weaker demand into higher supply. So the supply chain issue is, is the very definition of transitory inflation because because the supply chain issue is itself transitory, unless we believe that supply chains are gonna be permanently impaired. And the evidence is that we're already seeing most of these clear, other than a few uh, items that are, that are severely impacted that are still showing an increase in price. Um, so supply chain issues, definitely an inflationary impulse, but those will clear and those will contribute to a downturn uh, in inflation one, once those are uh, resolved. The money supply issue is, is less of an inflationary impact in my view, um, mainly because looking at money supply in isolation is an extremely um, overused analysis and in my opinion, it's, it's uh, a misused analysis. And the reason is because we know that GDP is equal to money supply times velocity. And everyone's gonna freak out about velocity, but we have to accept that if GDP is the best measure that we have in the economy, it's, uh, it's revised three times, it's revised then on an annual basis, and then there's a five-year benchmark revision, and there's no price mismeasurement. We can't say that it's, it's measuring inflation incorrectly because it's a nominal price series. So if GDP is the gold standard, and everyone's using M2 as their justification for inflation, aka a, a solid measure, how does it reason that we can take a gold standard measure divided by a gold standard measure and produce a non- 
gold standard measure. Yeah. That there's a, there's, a, there's a fallacy there. So if we take money supply in isolation, we can't take velocity in isolation either. We have to take the two of the factors together. And there was fiscal stimulus that went out, there's no question, but a lot of the money supply growth was also created through quantitative easing. And if we have tremendous amount of money supply growth that's all sitting uh, in bank deposits uh, and, and bank reserves, of course, that's certainly going to increase the money supply. But if that money is going to be trapped in financial markets and it's not going to uh, make it to the real economy, then velocity is going to tank. That's exactly what we, what we saw. And the result is going to be nominal GDP growth. And this is nominal, not real. That's still below the pre-COVID trend line. So if you take the trend line that the economy was on before COVID in nominal terms, we're still below that trend line. And the estimate for Q3 GDP continues to come down that we're not even going to surpass that level by Q3 after all of the fiscal stimulus. Yeah. So those would be the two, the two big reasons I'd give as to uh, combat the, the permanent inflationary narrative from those two factors. Yeah. You know, as you were, as you were just talking there, I just had a thought, uh, and I'd be curious to get your opinion on this because on the show before we've also talked about kind of, uh, these tran you know, more, um, impermanent or transitory factors like supply chain disruptions and maybe a more permanent, um, you know, factor of inflation might come from the, the long-term money supply. But uh, I don't know if you follow Pippa Malmgren at all, but uh, she talks about kind of the psychological component of inflation, right? And that is just the general belief that populaces eventually succumb to or, or um, you know, whatever, that, that prices are actually going to continue to go up. But what's starting to happen now is that I wonder if end user companies are starting to be like, well, it's actually acceptable for me to raise prices. I just did it last year. Maybe I can get away with it again and again. And as they figure out that this is actually a strategy that works and consumers get used to that, for the first time, I actually kind of can see the supply chain stuff in impacting the psychology of the consumer. Uh, and that, it doesn't fit neatly into a chart or a model or anything like that. But how important do you, do you ever consider that kind of side of there? What do you think of that whole argument? Yeah. So the way that I look at it is I always look at all these issues from a true macroeconomic sense. I find that a lot of times analysis gets overly focused on one specific good, which kind of is more micro than macro. You know, one example would be like rent inflation. Everyone's focused on rent inflation, but that's only one component of overall inflation. Yeah. So the, the phenomenon that you described of, of, of corporations passing on cost to consumers, we have to think, can every corporation across the whole consumer basket all simultaneously raise prices? And if they can, consumers have a nominal income trend. And if companies are going to continue to raise prices and that nominal trend is not going to go up as fast, we're going to see real incomes decline. And I have a lot of charts on these that show that real income growth, specifically when you remove the transfer payments, is already negative. We have a negative real income growth when you remove the transfer payments. If you add the transfer payments back, in real terms, uh, income is no higher than it was than the pre-COVID trend. Mm. So what's happening is corporations, corporations that have more pricing power, are trying to pass these, these uh, prices along, and some of them are being accepted, and we're seeing a rise in, in the consumer price index. But what's not happening is real incomes aren't rising. All of this, these uh, uh, rises in consumer prices are completely eating away all of the, the wage gains that we're seeing in nominal terms. So we have real income growth that's declining. And as soon as real income growth started to decline, well, what happened? We started to see this real cyclical downturn in the economy start to, to begin. We saw the Atlanta Fed just four weeks ago had Q3 GDP at almost 6.5%. As of today, it's down to 3.6. 3 We've seen uh, company, uh, uh, all the major banks start to revise their GDP numbers down. Um, all that's a function of real incomes not being able to, uh, it, or, or real income not uh, being able to increase. We can't, we can't increase consumers' real income beyond what they can uh, accept from uh, the price increases. So what's going to happen is, is some consumer, uh, companies are going to continue to pass these uh, prices on the uh, companies that have more pricing power, but we're going to start to see the marginal items fall out of the consumer basket as their real incomes can't keep up. And that's the macroeconomic piece that most that everyone misses. Everyone says there's a huge correlation between rent inflation and home price inflation. Totally, totally agree. And if you, if you do the lead lag on the chart, it says that rent inflation could rise as high as 7%. 
okay, if rent inflation rises as high as 7%, but the nominal income trend doesn't change, the real income is going to come down and that consumer is going to have to take that out in some other item in their basket. So that's the disinflationary offset to some of the inflation. And when Got we it. look at it in a macro sense, we're not seeing the full basket. And we're also starting to see some of the uh, inflation trends, even in the CPI, start to roll over already. So like the durable goods. Mm. So it's almost like reverse whack-a-mole. So I don't know if you know Steve Van Meter as well, but he came on the show and made a relatively similar argument there, which is basically that, uh, you know, if I'm correctly summarizing what you're saying, which is that if uh, people's incomes don't rise, if one section of that core PC or CPI bucket goes up, necessarily it's going to have to come out of somewhere else, right? So one that's thing exactly pops, right. the other goes down, basically. That's exactly right. And, you know, here's an amazing thing that's happening with the economy, and it just shows the, the sort of the you know, the magic, I want to say, of free markets and how they kind of align. If you take a, a measure of, everyone looks at average hourly earnings. I have an article on my website about why it's a terrible measure. It's, it's a ratio, right? You know, mm -hmm. you could have 100 hours or, you know, $100 in one hour, and then that could be a increase in average hourly earnings. But if, you're, but if your total aggregate income is lower, then it doesn't matter. So if we take the average weekly earnings in the economy, not hours, just the average weekly earnings times the number of people working. That gives you your aggregate income earned in the economy. So if we take the trend pre-COVID, mm -hmm. there was obviously a major decline uh, in aggregate income, and then there was a major snapback. What's really fascinating is everyone's looking at the average weekly earnings and saying that the number's gone up significantly, and that's very much true. But what also has happened is that we currently have millions fewer non-farm payrolls than we did before COVID, right? right? If you take the, the trend line, we're still missing about 9 million jobs relative to that trend, but average hourly or, or average weekly earnings are way higher. But if you, if you multiply the two numbers together to get aggregate income earned, the trend line is exactly the same. <laughs> so what that means is that because of the structural shifts that happened in the economy after COVID, a lot of, a lot of um, did, digitization and the removal of a lot of low-income jobs or some estimates that we could have removed as much as 3 million low-income jobs, we have less people with a higher average hourly earning and the aggregate income when you put them together is exactly the same. So we got rid of millions of low-income jobs. If those jobs presumably won't come back, the economy still stays on the same aggregate income trend. And the question now becomes what do we do with the people that have permanently lost those jobs? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm pretty torn about a lot of this uh, because on the one hand, you talk about wages in the U.S. and they really haven't moved, uh, for especially like the lowest income bracket in a long period of time, right? Financial assets have done really well. This is the basis of the argument for why we have such record wealth and income inequality. I just don't know when I see these people holding out and not going back to work. I, I just, I'm not really sure where we go as a, as a, as a country from. Do, do you think that we do bounce back uh, in the labor market, we get to the unemployment rate that we were before. Do you think salaries for these lower income jobs do pop up? Uh, I mean, I, I want to get into China and their labor market and how we've essentially kind of subsumed that into our own. But like, where, where do you just think the future of kind of wage growth, especially on that lower income side and bracket? That, where, where do we go from here for the US? When we saw innovation or invention in, in, a, in a prior life, like the invention of the car, that changed the uh, demand for natural resources forever, right? That was a step function increase in the amount of natural resource that we were going to need. It also created tons of, uh, uh, of more demand for labor because now we needed roads, we needed bridges, we needed uh, parts, we needed tires, we needed rubber, we needed so many things. So that's an example of technology that increases the amount of land labor capital that you need. All of the technology that we're seeing today is specifically geared towards removing labor. So all the technology today is designed to reduce the amount of labor and resources that we need, which is the, which is the disinflationary impact of technology versus the inflationary impact of technology many years ago. Yep. So to, to answer your original question, I do believe that the economy is going to continue marching forward with significantly less employees than we needed before, producing on roughly the same GDP trend. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a guy, there's another speech. Do you know uh, Sir James uh, Goldsmith? Uh, in the US? Have you ever heard this, this speech that he gave on free trade? Oh, man. 
this guy in like whenever the um you know nafta was was kind of designed and created he, he went up and he basically went out against uh, global free trade and he said look if you have developed if you have labor markets in developed countries competing against labor markets in undeveloped countries where literally the cost is at that time was like 120th or 110th he's like i'm just telling you how human incentives work this is what is going to happen and it's crazy because <clears throat> he was derided for this you know uh, honestly a lot of the same right. arguments that you see today he's xenophobic uh you know he doesn't get it um and man this guy was just like dead right uh you know <laughs> along Spot along on. yeah you know, if you look at the last 30 or so years of globalization, a huge um, deflationary force, right? De globalization has been a huge deflationary force. Um, and in many ways, you know, Mike Green drew a very interesting analogy, which was empires tend to get built on cheap labor, uh, forced labor in many cases, but certainly cheap labor uh, in many. And if you look at kind of one way of looking at the relationship between the China and the U.S. is we have subsumed a large portion of their labor force into our own, right? We've moved, we essentially, you know, we call it outsource, but we've just moved our manufacturing over to a cheaper labor pool. And that's right. You kind of look at that. So um, I guess for me, one thing that gets left out of the inflation deflation discussion a lot is just our current relationship with China, as well as wages over in China as well, which seem to be on the rise. My, one, my interpretation of the regulatory crackdown is this is the Chinese government saying, we actually want to prioritize uh, our internal wages and, and quality of life and stuff like that. How do you think about just the impact of China, both the current geopolitical relationship between the U.S. and China, uh, everything that, how, how do you think about the relationship between what's going on in China and uh, wage growth over here in the U.S.? So the relationship with China is obviously <clears throat> probably the most important in terms of global macro relations. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't have a great read on the, on the wage pressure in, in, in China, uh, right now, but what I would say is that if, for whatever reason, U.S. companies had to start um, paying much higher wages in China, I would I would think, based on the trends, that that corporate margins would decline because they're not going to be able to pass on higher costs to U.S. consumers if, again, the U.S. incomes aren't rising. So if the U.S. income trend is is constant, or to be more frank, if significant portions of the economy are run off of, of, of government income streams, which are, are more stable, and all of a sudden you have a huge rise in labor costs, that's going to reduce corporate margins, which would have negative knock-on effects in the U.S. Uh, the other thing is that they may shift labor from China to another area that's even cheaper than they are now. Um, but one of, the, one of the issues that I like to, to bring up also is that there is this uh, dynamic between we're heavily reliant on other countries for our production. But the, the flip side of that is that those countries are heavy, heavily reliant on producing things for our consumption. So those economies don't have enough internal demand to support consumption on their own. Here's a really good example and something for a lot of people to ponder. Over the last 10 years, from like 2009 to 2019, Japan had uh, about five recessions. Europe, I think, had maybe two, two or three in there. But both Europe and Japan had um, very, very, very weak growth, even weaker than the U.S. during that 10-year period. And during that 10-year period, we had uh, spectacular growth in China, and we had moderate growth in the U.S., Despite incredible infrastructure growth in China and despite uh, steady consumption growth in the United States, both those economies, which produce a lot of goods for those two places to consume, still really had a difficult time ever escaping recessionary conditions. So if there was to be a major decline in U.S. consumption, how would those or, or how would any of the production economies uh, stave off major contractions in their economy when all they do is produce for the consumption of basically two or three places. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting point. I never heard that. I never really heard it flipped like that before. Uh, but definitely an interesting kind of Overton window sort of shift. So let's get into uh, kind of how you think investors should prepare, right? Let, let's talk about like so your uh, kind of base case, right, is that we continue to be in this deflationary environment that we've had for the last uh, you know ten or fifteen or however many years. Um, how should investors be thinking about constructing a portfolio? Uh, what sort of assets do you like? Just give us your kind of 10,000 foot view. 
Sure. So the way that I um, look at portfolio management or asset allocation is that generally when growth and inflation are in, so everything that I do is, is what I call rate of change or second derivative. So yep. if the growth rate of the economy goes from zero to 4% or the growth rate goes from 8% to 4%, you end up at four in both cases, but one's declining, one's increasing. They're, they're different. When the growth rate in the economy, growth or inflation, uh, nominal growth is increasing, uh, stocks tend to outperform bonds. Industrial commodities uh, tend to outperform uh, precious metals like gold. And within equities, uh, you tend to see outperformance of all of the cyclical equities, things like financials, industrials, materials, small caps, all of the more high risk type investments. Uh, conversely, when growth and inflation are coming down, you tend to see an outperformance of long duration treasury bonds over stocks. You tend to see an outperformance of uh, precious metals like gold over industrial commodities. And within the equity universe, you see uh, defensive type investments like utilities, consumer staples and large cap tech performing the best. So with all of those things in mind, the way that I approach this uh, the investment world is I personally start with a balanced asset allocation framework. Uh, I encourage everyone to pick whatever asset allocation uh, that works for them as sort of a home base. Everyone needs to have a home base of an asset allocation of where do I revert to when I have no idea what, what's going to happen. And for me, the, the allocation that I like is the all weather allocation, which includes long term bonds, intermediate term bonds, stocks, commodities, and gold. It's sort of got a nice blend of everything. And based on the outlook over the next six to 18 months, which comes from a combination of those secular trends and the shorter term cyclical trends, I then just simply tilt that asset allocation in the direction of the assets that are most likely to perform well. So uh, when I was interviewing with Lynn earlier in this year and I had a call for a cyclical upturn in both growth and inflation, I was suggesting that you may want to have a heavier commodity exposure, you may want to be underweight on your long term bonds, and your equity exposure could be tilted toward things like Russell 2000 versus S&P 500. Uh, all of that has now shifted now that we're in a cyclical downturn in both growth and inflation. So relative to whatever your personal asset allocation is, uh, the, the forward looking trends would suggest that you should tilt slightly more defensively. Uh, which would be things like your disinflationary assets, like your treasury bonds, maybe have a little bit more cash because volatility in the markets uh, is generally a little bit higher. Uh, and then I would expect downward momentum for a lot of, of the industrial commodities. Um, and that's sort of how I approach the asset allocation. Got it. In terms of, um, does your framework, do you, do you have like an idea of how long uh, kind of the cyclical component tends to last? Or how do you yeah, identify trading points too? Yeah, Yeah. Two awesome questions. So uh, when you go back over the last 30 years, uh, what we see is that the cyclical upturns tend to last about 1.1 years. And the cyclical downturns on average last about 1.6 years. So the first, the first key thing to realize is that the downturns tend to last longer than the upturns. Well, why is that? Because the secular trend is pushing everything lower. So we tend to spend more time in downturns than upturns. Japan, which is really far down the road, spends more time in recession than expansion. So we're just talking about downturns versus upturns, let alone contraction versus expansion. So the, um, the average length of time can give you an indication of kind of where we're at. And the current economic downturn has been going on for about seven months. The peak was about March. So seven months relative to an average of 1.6, that kind of gives you a, a frame of reference. But I don't use the averages to make the turning points. I use a leading indicator approach. And the leading indicator approach separates uh, leading indicators into two buckets, what we call longer leading indicators and shorter leading indicators. So the way that my process would work is that I would monitor a basket of longer leading data and say, okay, that started to turn higher. I should be on the lookout. It doesn't mean anything for asset allocation, but I should be on the lookout for some of the shorter leading indicators to start turning higher. As of right now, we have no upturn at all in the longer leading or shorter leading indicators, which gives me a conviction to say that I believe that the growth rate and the inflation rate in the economy is going to be turning down for, I would say, at least the next couple of months. I sort of go rolling forecast. Every month I update these views. But for at least the next couple of months, we're going to see downward momentum in both growth and inflation. Howdy, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Coinbase Prime, the leading prime brokerage solution for all things digital assets, providing secure custody, 
trading and financing to an institutional suite of clients. On the retail side of things, I am more than happy to make this endorsement because I have been a customer of Coinbase since the day that I got into crypto. I still keep the vast majority of my assets there actually, and I do it for one reason and one reason alone, so that I can sleep easy at night knowing that my funds are safe. It's the same reason when family or friends ask me, where should I buy my first Bitcoin? I direct them to Coinbase. And now, finally, when institutions are starting to ask, what's the most safe infrastructure to use? I only point them in one direction, to Coinbase Prime. And the reason that I do that is because it is peace of mind. When it comes to security, everything is top of the line on this platform, and it's a white glove experience to boot. They've been securing client assets at scale for eight years, which as of Q2 of this year is $180 billion. They have an industry leading insurance policy, and they're audited by Blue Chip auditors so that you can sleep easy at night too. So stop listening to me, click the link at the bottom of this episode, and go check them out for yourself. And when you get there, tell them that I sent you because I love to get credit. Howdy, everyone. If you're a long-term investor in Ethereum, then listen up because I am talking directly to you here. If you've been listening to the show for the last two months, then you know that I am a big, big fan of ETH and the entire world of DeFi that's being built on top of it. It's honestly just super, super interesting, but it's also probably the single greatest wealth creation opportunity that I am ever going to see in my entire life. And the best thing about ETH is that you can hold it, but with this new upgrade to 2.0, you can also stake it and earn yield that way. The only problem is under the current set of rules, unless you have 32 ETH or at today's price is almost $100,000, then you can't stake it. Until now. Our good friends over at Matrix Sport just unrolled a solution which allows investors with as few as 5 ETH to start staking today. At the time of this recording, you can earn up to 9% APY, although that's going to vary based on the protocol. So stop what you're doing. Stop listening to me. Go click the link at the bottom of this episode. If it's on YouTube or Spotify or Apple or whatever it is, click that link, go over to the website and tell them that I sent you. All right, give me a little credit, but definitely go click the link. Start learning about how you can stake your ETH and earn yield or other yield generation opportunities. So I got to ask you, do you have any opinions on kind of Bitcoin, both as store of value uh, and then also kind of that longer tail of ETH, uh, other sorts of crypto assets in general? So I don't have any uh, personal coverage of cryptocurrencies and any view on one coin to the next coin. Um, In, you know, the lead in, you talked about maybe some of the things that would change my mind. I'll sort of use this as a segue to central bank digital currencies because the the, um, proliferation of and popularity of the crypto space has given rise to central banks discussing uh, central bank digital currencies. And uh, all of the quantitative easing and quote unquote money printing in the United States today is not money printing in its in its truest sense, at least yep. in the way that, that I look at it. I have a video on YouTube uh, uh, on uh, quantitative easing and uh, why it's not you know inflationary to the CPI or anything like that. Um, one thing that would change, however, if we started to move in the direction of a central bank digital currency, which uh, it would depend on what shape it these took. things evolve in. Right is uh, the central bank would be going direct to uh, citizens with sort of, you know, crediting people's uh, account. And, you know, de- depending on the way it, it, it unfolded, it would be highly unlikely that they can retract all of the existing money that's currently in circulation. So we'd almost start to have two competing currencies. We'd have the central bank digital currency that people are getting direct payments on. We'd have money that was already flowing in circulation. And what tends to happen historically when that, uh, in situations like this is the currency that's perceived to have less value starts to circulate really fast because people try and get rid of it for the currency that's perceived to have more value. And that's when the velocity of money starts to rise because people start to say, we got these two currencies, one's a central bank currency, one's a, you know, dollars that I used to have, one of them's got more or less value, I'm going to try and get rid of this one in exchange for that one. And it starts this, uh, starts this cycle of, of high velocity. And that's when inflation can really start to uh, start to increase. Yeah. So uh, one thing that would really get me to change my mind would be the uh, the change, which would require a change in law, would require a change of Congress of central banks uh, spending money into the economy versus lending into the economy against treasury securities or other things like that. Mm. Or it just would require a big enough crisis. Right. Uh, clearly, those <laughs> yeah. rules can be bent uh, in times of crisis. Right. Oh, but there was an SPV. Yeah. OK. Uh, yeah, still broke the rules. you know those. I have to say those those SPVs were were constructed in um, you know in hindsight. What I would say is a masterful way to sort of save face with. Uh, I mean, there's no doubt that you could look at the laws that are written and 
say that the intent was clearly to circumvent uh, what they were doing when when you look, you know, I'm sure it could pass the red face test and, 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 and it did clearly. Mm -hmm. um, but that was definitely, I would agree, a really fine line between, you know, the intent was certainly to go around it. The way in which they did it was sort of masterful in a way that they could sort of sit there and say that we're still just lending to an SPV. It was sort of, you know, the way it was constructed, it really was in effect the, the treasury that was taking on the risk of, uh, of defaults in any of these SPVs, which, which didn't end up happening. And the Fed was, you know, technically lending to the SPVs. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you can frame it however you want. They interfered in the, 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 the corporate bond, the, the high yield bond market. Um, I'm not even right. saying it was a bad move. Uh, again, I, I don't spend a lot of time defending the Fed, but like what they did clearly worked in at least one very important sense, right? Um, and, and it also emphasized, at least so far, the credibility of the Fed because a lot of people don't realize they barely bought any corporate bonds. It was just the like announcement. 13 billion, the, right? It was 13 yeah, billion it was, out of it, 500 it was, and, and, yeah. and the day of the announcement turned everything around. So when people say the Fed has lost credibility, they still have quite a bit of credibility in yeah. the sense that you know, they didn't have to buy any bonds. Uh, really, to, no. to change the corporate bond market. Now, when just to sum up what you were saying before about central bank digital currencies, uh, maybe that would change your mind about the inflation versus deflation debate. Are you kind of referring to the Lacey Hunt uh, thing, which is right as soon as the uh, liabilities of central bank become legal tender? That's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah, okay. that's exactly right. Which, which even with the SPVs, is still not what we what we have today. So all the liabilities are still not able to circulate in the real economy. Uh, and that would be the defining line because that would be, like I said, now we have sort of two competing currencies that are kind of out there. Yeah. So that that would be the defining line. And, you know, if, if I have 60 seconds, I would like to just sort of throw one more thing into this MMT argument is that um, a lot of people view this, this, ex, this extreme government spending as sort of they can solve any problem and they can generate inflation and growth through that way. But... Uh, there, there is a accounting way to look at this, which is like, you know, four trillion from the government sector is the same as four trillion from the private sector. Uh, and then there's sort of an econometric way, which takes the second, third and fourth order impacts of government spending versus private sector spending. And there's three key points uh, to mention that may have negative impacts uh, from the government sector versus the private sector, which is first is that the government sector is not always operating with a profit motive. Right. I'll try and keep this short. There can be social agenda and they can try and influence things that may not be pro growth. We could argue whether they should do it or not. But in terms of growth, certainly not beneficial for growth if they're trying to steer social policy. The second thing, and this is reviewed in the research, it's very hard to argue, especially with the situation in the United States, is that the larger the government gets, there's a tendency for uh, special interest groups to emerge. And the larger the government gets, the larger the special interest groups get. And then there's the probability for rent seeking behavior and transfer payments from one group to another group, not very pro growth uh, at all, sort of just transferring money from from the public sector to a few people's pockets. Obviously, that's going on in, in extreme quantities today. Uh, no one needs to argue that specifically in the US. The third thing is that larger government tends to lend itself to higher taxation. And their peer-reviewed research suggests that the distortionary effect of taxation is equal to the squared tax rate. Sounds kind of crazy, but all that means is that low levels of taxation have a little distortionary effect, and then it ramps up really quickly because it's a squared equation. And then the last thing would be that as the government gets larger and they don't want to pass large tax increases on to people because it's not politically palatable, what they tend to do is they tend to incorporate what are called a lot of indirect taxes. Right. Gas tax, sales tax. Uh, you know, you register your car, you have to get a tax. You register, you know, your bicycle, you have to get a tax, whatever the case may be. And those are all indirect taxes that are 100 here, 300 here, 85 here. They add up over time. And those taxes are more politically palatable because they don't hit the mainstream, but they're extremely regressive because they impact yeah. lower income people more than higher income people. So a lot of the MMT arguments want to have all the benefits of government spending without all of that negative. And the data shows that you can't really have that negative as the government grows to control 30, 40, 50 percent of the whole economy. Yeah, I will say, um, and you know, I was talking about this. So this episode will air in like two weeks. And I just talked with Jim Bianco, uh, who's airing next week. And um, you know, what he will have said uh, last week at the time that this goes live is that he really agrees with the descriptor 
of the MMT folks, but not necessarily the prescription or the solution. And honestly, you know, I've listened to Stephanie Kelton a lot and I, like half of what she says I agree with. And and she does come out and say like, look, we just don't really know what causes inflation, which to me is a is actually a breath of fresh air because I really do fully believe if you've been calling for inflation for 40 years and it finally happens, you don't get to say you were right. You shouldn't get to <laughs> right. say you were right. Like, oh, yeah, at some point in the future, we'll have it, right? I mean... For sure, for sure. Uh, you know, I, 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 I kind of view the financial system as one big chaotic system. And the best that any one of us can do is hope to set a framework around one small part of it, generate some alpha there, and, and earn a living, right? But, you know, I... I kind of object to these, uh, these like, and like, oh, I understand how all this works and input it. It's, it's very <laughs> right, complicated, right. man. It's complicated. It's commentary stuff. for every yeah, every every market. It's tough. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. No, and and I I would echo Jim's point um, uh, in that there are so many um, externalities of a large government sector that are outlined very clearly in the research. Um, a lot of the ones I just mentioned and. There seems to be a growing camp that suggests that more and more fiscal spending or more and more government intervention will create seemingly better results without any of those negative externalities. And that's just never been really proven. Yeah. Um, so that's sort of where I, where I shake out on that. So one thing that I would – this is not my original thinking, but it's the view that I've come down on with central bank digital currencies – the way I've heard them talked about recently is like, this is inevitable. Get ready because like it or not, good idea or not good idea, it's coming. And at least in the US, I'm not actually sure that that's the case. And the reason why is because of the importance of our commercial banking sector and the relationship that have regulators and the central bank has with that sector. Such a good point. You know, Such a good point. Because it would be extremely, like the Fed doesn't, it depends on how the CBDC is constructed, but the Fed doesn't want a direct banking relationship, from what I can tell, with every it U.S. It would totally citizen. cut out the commercial banking system. And it would cut the commercial banking system out. And if you want an That's interesting right. like preview or tidbit about how the Fed might react to this, look up something called the Narrow Bank, um, which was essentially a proposal to pool money uh, between various accredited investors or institutional investors and be able to park it at the Fed. And they shut that down uh, with the explicit uh, feedback that – then, you know, if you could park money directly at the Fed, why do we have a commercial banking system and it undermines confidence? So right. I just right. don't, maybe in China, maybe, uh, you know, yeah. the DCP, but I, I don't think in the U.S. we're going to actually have one. Uh, yeah, and, and this, this sort of fork in the road where we go inflation or deflation, you know, I sort of want to clarify my, my view is um, I, I take a rolling, you know, view on a cyclical trend over six to 18 months and a rolling sort of three to five year view on the secular trends. Mm -hmm. If you were to tell me, are we going to have inflation or deflation 15 years from now? I couldn't tell you. Uh, but what, what I would say is that um, we have, obviously, in the United States, and I'll just take the U.S. as an example. This can really be applied to a lot of the DMs, is we have this uh, tremendous debt burden. We have declining demographics, and we have a tremendous debt burden, public and private. Both of those are going to severely weigh on growth. A lot of people sit there and say, well, we can inflate our way out of the debt. I could go on for an hour about why we can't do that, but one simple reason is that all of we can't really discuss the the uh, debt problem without talking about the entitlements. And the entitlements would be like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and then any of the uh, unemployment or any other transfer payments that we decide to do. All of the future debt burden is pretty much in in that pie. All of those uh, transfer payments are implicitly or explicitly linked to inflation. So we just saw an article the other day saying that the Social Security cost of living adjustment was, is going to be over 6% because the inflation rate was 6%. So how do you solve an inflation-linked debt burden through inflation? You really can't, right? The only way you could do it is if you break the link to inflation, which would then reduce everyone's real income because now it's not a real payment anymore. It's sort of – you can't really have an entitlement program without an inflation link because in five years it's not really very good anymore. So all of these things are inflation linked. So having a CPI at six, seven, eight percent, we're going to quickly realize it doesn't really reduce any of our burden because everything that's coming onto the balance sheet every year is coming on in real terms. So what we're going to have is we're going to have just an absolutely crushing debt burden all in real terms and a decline in demographics that uh, over the next several years is going to make the economy 
very, very difficult to grow. And if we keep going further and further out, this gets worse and worse. We will come to a point at some, uh, and I can't exactly say when, where we are spending fiscally $5 trillion, $7 trillion, $9 trillion, $10 trillion, and the economy is not growing. Mm. The economy can't grow. You have diminishing marginal returns. You have yeah. all these negative externalities of government size coming in, and you're spending... You know, the government represents 50, 60, 70 percent of the economy and real GDP per capita growth is still barely above zero. The question then becomes, what do we do now? Yeah. And you have really and you have people making convincing arguments that at that point we go in the central bank currency. We go towards a total like whatever the case may be. Once we get to that point, we're now in the land of sort of hypothesis and uh I almost want to call it, you know, I don't want to call it sci-fi because it will end up being a real scenario, but it's, it's anyone's best guess what the, what the world looks like on the other side of that. Totally. And I don't, I don't want to uh, give the impression that when we get to that fork, I'm saying it's still deflation. I'm saying that we will continue to grind lower in terms of the growth rate and the inflation rate in the economy. You'll have transitory spikes, cyclical ups and downs, but the long-term trend will continue to go that way even if the government sector, and specifically if the government sector continues to grow, and then at some point later down the road, we'll be faced with this problem of the government spending trillions and trillions of dollars every single year, growth still can't move, now what do we do? And at that point, that's when it opens up the you know, possibilities to basically anything. Yeah, you've been super generous with your time. If listeners wanna find out more about you and the work that you do, what's the best way to do that? EPBMacroResearch.com is where you can find basically everything. And then I'm super active on Twitter, which is at EPBResearch. Amazing. Eric, this has been great, my friend. Thank you so much. So much fun. Black shirt gang, Thank we're going to have to reunite uh, very <laughs> soon. Uh, cool. Thanks. Definitely. Definitely. Appreciate, it. Appreciate it. Talk to you soon.